Welcome to Notepad. I'm your host, Ibrahim Sani. We're still talking about uh, digital banking licenses uh, that has just uh, recently been uh, announced as, as closure in terms of uh, the date of application, uh, which is on 30th June. Um, so far, news reports have shown 29 applicants have uh, submitted their uh, requests to be uh, given the license, uh, of which what we understand is to be about five licenses at most uh, is to be given out. So there's a lot of competition here and we're trying to understand what makes uh, one particular um, applicant uh, have a little bit of an advantage over the other. Uh, one such uh, applicant is uh, Pertama Digital Berhad uh, because uh, they have uh, announced that they are one of the many applicants uh, that has applied for a digital banking license to Bank Negara Malaysia. Um, there's a lot to unpack here and I'm pretty sure that a lot of us want to know more, not just about the applicants themselves but uh, perhaps uh, the uh, framework of how the digital banking uh, universe is going to look like in this country but more importantly how they can uh, be profitable uh, in the three to five year time frame because it's going to be a tough environment for everyone to uh, operate in. Uh, joining us for this evening is Saifi Akhta, the Pertama Digital's uh, Director of Strategy. Um, Saifi, th thanks for taking the time to speak with us. Pleasure. Now there's a lot, there's a lot for us to unpack here, but uh, let's go through with the company itself. Pertama Digital, Berhad, you are listed on the main boards. Uh, let's talk about what the company has been doing for the past few years and what the direction is going to be for the next few years to come. Sure. So um, Pertama Digital Berhad started in the, in the 80s um, as a fabric manufacturer and it has been doing that for um, about 30 years. And uh, about two years ago, uh, due to declining business in the existing uh, industry, um, there was a decision that was made to pivot to, um, to the digital side of things, so digital businesses. And so that was uh, complete in about uh, mid-2020. And uh, one of the first investments made uh, into a digital business was in uh, Tapat Vista, Sydney and Berhad. Uh, which is in the GovTech space and has been in that space since uh, the year 2000. Um, so, so moving forward, uh, we are looking at, um, you know, it, we're taking a very simple strategy and that st strategy is around identifying, um, you know, simple problems or challenges that we can see uh, in the day-to-day -day operations of our lives here in Malaysia, um, and then putting forward some really compelling solutions to solve those problems. Uh, and, you know, these days, coincidentally, most of those problems are solved with uh, digital tools. Um, we are currently, um, I would say, experts in the space of uh, government payments. And we have been doing um, the, this, this uh, we have an app called MyPay that um, allows people to pay for PTPTN loans um, and check on their loan status, for example, um, and make certain uh, zakat and and uh, local uh, council payments. Um, and we also have a, an, a, a payment gateway that uh, is currently the, the one of the world's first uh, mobile-based uh, court bail payment system, uh, which has been doing very, very well. You know, some of the strategies, some of the best strategies are the simple ones. The problem is in the execution. Um, and of course, you are among the people that would appreciate the problems or the intricacies of uh, executing what needs to be done. Before we jump into what Pertama Digital's strategy is in terms of executing a digital bank, um, there's a lot of partnerships uh, that you guys have been building, uh, including Travel, uh, the right chair company that has been on this show a few times, Paywatch, Koala, Butterfly FX. Uh, there's a lot of uh, partnerships with uh, Credit uh, um, Bureau as well, um, Experian, quite a dominating scene because CTOS is also going for an IPO uh, very soon. Um, and uh, some partnerships with Labon Offshore. It's, it's a lot of partnerships here. Yeah. And, and this is without having a license. Uh, so I don't know what it will, uh, how the company will look like with a license. What yeah, is so, the strategy so, going forward when it comes to building these kind of partnerships? Is it a long lasting partnership that needs to be done? Is it a touch and go type of thing? Uh, talk to us uh, through all these kind of uh, strategic partnerships that you guys are building with. Sure. So if we just hark back to what I first said, uh, which was about identifying uh, problems, right? And, um, you know, we, we can't approach the market or the or the or the situation with uh, hubris and and you know belief that we can do everything ourselves. So what we are doing is we're taking on a, a collaborative approach, and that means uh, being the best technology company um, for all kinds of organizations to partner with. And what we are demonstrating and what we are really successful at doing is attracting not just 
public agencies, um, but we are attracting large PLCs. I mean, Experian is a company that's you know even bigger than than Maybank, um, and we're also attracting the innovators. You've mentioned Trevo. Um, Paywatch is a uh, earned wage access uh, uh, company that's doing very, very well. Um, and uh, Butterfly Effects uh, was actually run by a group of uh, ex-BNM uh, financial literacy uh, professionals, right? And what we're doing is we're creating a platform uh, for these companies to come forward um, to work together on solving uh, problems that the Rangyad is facing. Um, and and you know, we speak the same language. That's exciting to see, right? We are starting to attract people because of the vision and the story that we are telling, you know. And um, maybe some of these partnerships um, may not lead to a big business, uh, but I'm really, really excited specifically about uh, what we're doing with Experian. Um, we are planning to create an alternative credit score. Um, a consent-based alternative credit score uh, based on the information that we have already as a company, as well as what we're going to be getting from the digital bank license if we are successful. Um, and just to demonstrate the, the kind of uh, disruptive mindset we have, um, we, we are going to be making this alternative credit score available to, to everyone on the market. So all the digital banking applicants, um, uh, the successful ones, all the incumbent banks, all the fintechs will all be able to use this, right? So uh, what we are offering the market is a, a new way of looking at things and a new way of solving problems. Uh, it can't be done in silos. Okay, let's uh, get uh, down to the weeds here. Uh, you guys uh, have secured uh, partnerships or, or investors uh, from the uh, Labuan Offshore Bank Perfect Hexagon Commodity. Uh, you guys have uh, struck a partnership with uh, Al Sirat um, an investment bank that is going to be one of your key investors moving forward. Uh, the initial capital, uh, as required by Benagari, is 100 million. Uh, still quite low compared to other um, capital requirements from other countries uh, in this uh, region. Um, to put in contrast, for instance, Singapore requires 4.6 billion um, ringgit, uh, Hong Kong about 161 million ringgit. So it's it's quite, you know, I wouldn't say um, uh, uh, easy to get by 100 million ringgit, but at the same time, it's quite low compared to other markets. So that's one part of that equation. The other part is how do you intend to be profitable in the near uh, to midterm uh, strategy? And I, I know for a fact that, that Benagara's main concern would be one of this, which is how do you turn into profit as quick as possible? So, so how much can you share with us when it comes to capital requirements uh, and, of course, the strategy to turning into profit very quick, assuming you get uh, the uh, license? Sure, so I'll share as much as I can. Um, let's first start with the 100 mil uh, minimum capital requirements. And yes, you're right. It's amongst the lowest or the, or the lowest in the region. And even uh, when you reach uh, um, full compliance in, in, in three to five years, it's still only uh, 300 million, right? So it is very low. So that's a very nice low barrier of entry, which is going to attract um, a lot of innovators and, and, and uh, smaller players, right? Um, and that's nice to see. But interestingly, uh, Bank Nagara has also introduced other barriers that I see as uh, a little bit more difficult to achieve. So, as you mentioned correctly, one is the uh, the requirement to demonstrate a clear path to profitability. Okay, um, and the second is to actually have a, a very clear indication and focus on how we're going to solve financial inclusion here in Malaysia. Right, so these are two things that Bank Nagara really wants to see, and it and it's reflected in one of the first pages in the digital banking framework. Right, so mm -hmm. so you know the the profitability piece um, is actually pretty simple. Right, so the only difference between um, a bank and uh, you know a, a technology company that has a combination of other licenses, your e-money license, your online money lending license, uh, you know. And there are other combinations of licenses that you could use to operate uh, fintech offerings. But the only difference that a bank gives you is that it allows you to collect deposits, right? So that that therein lies the secret, right? So if you are able to um, to 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 create a sustainable deposit engine, and that is uh, deposits that's coming from um, you know a, a, a sustainable source uh, at a at a low cost, that is then um, allows you to drive or to create 
uh, financing products that are that are fair and equitable, right? Um, that is basically how a bank would be viable in the in the first three to five years, right? And that's exactly where uh, Pertama Digital strengths lie. So the way that we've uh, that we've created our consortium is a really simple, straight cut, right? So the deposit engine is brought by Pertama Digital. So we have uh, we are really strong with. Uh, our relationships with uh, large organizations, be they public or private. Uh, and in a lot of the digitalization solutions that we bring to the table, um, it involves us uh, um, collecting deposits or routing deposits to, to incumbent banks, right? So, um, you know, if you look at a recent report, I think it was in early June, uh, the e-money the e license market was uh, touted to be growing really well and fast. And it was said that uh, in five years across all e-money licenses, the total deposits was uh, 1.6 billion ringgit as of 2021. Um, and, you know, Pratama Digital is going to uh, surpass that by the time this bank goes live in late 2022, right? And that's just from one organization. So that's what Pratama Digital's role is in the consortium. On the other side, we have Crowdo. Crowdo is a a fast-growing uh, fintech. Uh, they're based uh, in Singapore, but they have uh, operation here in Malaysia as well as in Indonesia. And uh, Crowdo has a secret sauce on how to lend viably uh, to to um, small businesses that have very thin credit profiles, right? And so we have the input being deposits at low cost. And then we have the output being a, a, a dependable and repeatable credit model for small businesses. And in the middle, we then have uh, InfoPro, which is a homegrown, very, very successful uh, um, banking software company. And uh, they, we, we, we went for them specifically because unlike the more flashy uh, you know, uh, overseas options, uh, InfoPro has uh, a specialist at uh, banking service in emerging markets. So if you look at their current customers, they're all across Southeast Asia, um, Africa, um, and the Middle East, and, and you know, let's face it, the, the kind of market that we're going through, we need to have that kind of expertise at the table. Okay, um, uh, you were opening the statement with uh, a statement, you know, the two kind of um, uh, restrictions that you feel is quite problematic that Benegar has imposed. Why, why do you feel that uh, it's a questionable uh, requirement by Bank Negara asking you guys what is the path to profitability? What's what's wrong with the regulator asking you that? It's nothing wrong for me. So I love it, right? So our our financial model uh, delivers profitability well before uh, what I would say Bank Negara expects. So we are clearly uh, and comfortably going to be profitable within the first uh, uh, three years of operations, right? Okay. So, so I'm really happy with that. The However, second item, the second item when we talked about um, financial inclusion, what what what's up with that? Okay, so so th that's the thing, right? So with with financial inclusion, um, and and again, I hope you didn't uh, get me wrongly. I I am a fan, and I, I'm happy that Ben Nagara has, uh, you know, put these uh, uh, you know focuses into the framework. And in fact, the financial inclusion piece was the one reason why uh, my team and I said, look, this is something we want to do. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I said, Pratama Digital exists to solve problems, right? And we know and we see on a day-to-day -day basis that, um, well, there are people who are financially excluded right here in the Klang Valley. We don't have to look far into a corner of Kelantan. And there's all kinds of data, um, you know, that, that, that the researchers have done and, and it's made available that um, the current services that are provided by incumbent banks, by uh, fintechs, um, are not sufficient in order to get this, this, this group of people, these demographics, into the formal financial system. And that problem is going to be amplified because of the pandemic. Okay, okay. so the pandemic is making it difficult for people um, who aren't like you and I, you know, who can't just jump on the call and do business. You know, the whole, the whole digital banking application that we did at Pratama Digital, 99% remote, right? So the deal close with Experian was remote. The deal close with my consortium partners was remote. We didn't have to meet face to face and we can put together, you know, a 500 million ringgit business, you know. Mm. Um, and, and, and that's because we're privileged. But there are people who are standing on the corners of the streets who 
who are just clueless, right? How do we deal with MCOs? How do we deal with uh, restriction uh, on movement? Um, how do we how do we earn an income, right? So those are the kind of people that we're trying to focus on, and um, we are we are setting out ourselves not to just look at SMEs or MSMEs because it, it tends to get a bit cold. Personally, I think we have to look at the humans who are powering uh, these businesses, right? And we have to take um, a holistic approach into helping them make ends meet. And so we are positioning ourselves as a productive and ethical financing bank um, for B40 households. We are looking at households and not just businesses. Okay. Uh, we'll go for one short break uh, before we continue our conversation uh, with uh, Pratama Digital. Thank you. Thanks for staying on with us. I have with me uh, the Director of Strategy for Pertama Digital, Saifi Akhtar. They are applying uh, for a digital banking license from Bank Negara. Um, let's talk about the market itself, uh, Saifi. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not about financial inclusion as in for Malaysia, like at least. Uh, it's not about getting Malaysians a banking account. Uh, data has shown that uh, you know Malaysians have uh, a large amount of Malaysians do have banking accounts. If you compare against, say, you know other markets in the region, um, so it's not just about getting them a banking account. It's trying to get them the cheapest financial product and facility available to them. Uh, and of course, this is just a tool. The issue here is on wealth creation. Uh, the issue here is on the ability for them to earn more which is, quite frankly, uh, a bigger job than both you and I. I. I mean, I can ask you guys all those questions and you can deliver the kind of uh, products and services that you can get. But the issue is about wage. The issue is about the economy. And now with the economy slowed down near a halt, uh, not just in, uh, you know, uh, Klang Valley, around the country also is facing the same thing. And while other countries are, you know, getting ready to recover, Malaysia is well far from that point uh, of uh, recovery just yet. These are macroeconomic issues, and of course, you are trying to an, enter a space where everything revolves around the macro trends and the mega trends that is impacting the country and the region. How do you fit your business into the global climate right now? Do you feel that you have a greater important part to play, or this is just a small solution that you're offering to the market? The bigger it, issue here is, is you know, middle income trap, wage, those kind of stuff. What's your view on these mega trends? Okay, so let, let's take a step back and look at what typically happens after pandemics, right? So if we look back to the 14th century um, when we had the Black Plague, um, you know, yes, a third of Europe uh, died, okay? And what happens is then you had businesses that were uh, lacking the labor or, or access to affordable labor. And what happens next is you have two things that happen. You have the uh, printing press uh, being created, so there's innovation uh, because you know they wanted automation around, uh, you know things that people used to do, uh, you know with their hands uh, before the pan before the pandemic, and secondly, the, the young men started to look at adventuring overseas uh, or going for sea voyage. Uh, as something that was less risky than staying at home and dying from a pandemic. That was what happened in the 14th century. And what happens next is, of course, America is founded, right? And then, you know, you have the, the Spanish flu uh, in, in, the, in the 1920s. Uh, what, what happened after the Spanish flu was Sorry, that? That's a, that's a, that word is triggering a lot of memories. Uh, <laughs> but I got it right. Okay. You got it right. Got you it got right. <laughs> yeah, not somebody else. Okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. Go no, no, no problem. Yeah. So, so uh, what happens next is you see a, an increase uh, or a, a quick acceleration of manufacturing, like in uh, for for automobiles and so on. So, I believe that post pandemic, um, we are going to see a boom in innovation, and our goal is to include everyone. So that's the inclusive bit. Because you and I, if we were out on the street tomorrow without a job. Um, there's so much that we can do in order to earn an income, right? We have so many opportunities. We could do a million and one things. We could just go online, learn something, and start selling a service, so something that we just learned two weeks ago. We could do it. But there are, there's a whole group of people who can't. So this post-pandemic productivity uh, uh, growth or this, or, this, or this tsunami of a wave that's going to come in the next one or two years, um, we have to bring the rest of these 
uh, financially excluded people onto that wave. So I see that as a huge opportunity. It is not just one that is uh, um, you know, unique to Malaysia. We are going to be taking this to other emerging markets, and I am confident that this could be uh, a, a Malaysian-branded uh, model of uh, uh, financially included inclusion, uh, financially inclusive digital financial services. Um, and uh, you know, if, if we start looking yes, at, I, I understand what you're trying to say. Now I'm going to get you in a little bit more of a hot soup, uh, hot water here. Yeah. Do you feel that five licenses is too much? Uh, do you feel that state actors coming into the picture, like uh, the state of Sarawak, state of Johor, are applying just like you guys, uh, are conflicting um, or bl blending uh, public interest or government interests with corporate interests? What's your view on, on the size of licenses coming out? Or is it too little? What do you think about all this? I think there's space for more. Um, I think, uh, personally, I think that, that, that we could do with um, seven to ten licenses but that's my own personal opinion of course uh, yeah. and 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 uh, because the thing is this the, the the three billion ringgit asset cap is not that big right it's a small little tiny chip on the whole total asset size here in malaysia and uh, that gives you know a bit of flexibility for this bank uh, to 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 perform a certain way right and and for us to each try each of the applicants to try a different strategy in uh, solving these big issues um, i'm not going to comment on the state governments i'm not going to comment on uh, the other applicants I, I would say that i think we are in really good company you know, um, I'm, I'm really proud that Pratama Digital has uh, these uh, sort of consortiums that are, that are, you know, going for this license with us. Uh, but I will say this, um, there are individuals, or not individuals, there are organizations that are applying for the license that are already in a position to solve these problems. Okay, they're already in the position to do it, right? I want, I would like to see how a banking license and specifically uh, ability to collect deposits because that's all a banking license does, right? Uh, how does this change, you know, this organization's ability to deliver ethical and uh, productive and financially inclusive uh, products to, to the people who need it, the most vulnerable here in Malaysia? That is what I would like to understand. And of course, we'll see, uh, you know, when Bank Nagara makes their decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you, you stole thunder out, out of my speech right now because uh, when do you think uh, the announcement is going to be made? Uh, is it has it been publicly made, made announced uh, in terms of when they're going to announce it? Um, I believe it's it's due in the first quarter of 2022, okay. um, and uh, I'm hoping to be engaging with uh, Ben Nagara um, earlier than that. But uh, I, I don't have any information around that, and uh, you know we're just sitting tight. Uh, in the meantime, we are already starting. We are hitting the ground running, working with the partners that uh, you mentioned earlier in, 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 the, in the interview, um, because what we do doesn't depend on whether we get a license or not, right? It can start now, you know. So this license is what? Merely to deposit, uh, to take deposits, basically, because the rest, the, the services part, you can actually roll out right now. Am I right? Exactly. The services parts uh, can be rolled up uh, with in, in partnership with uh, fintechs, with incumbent banks, and we're already working with cooperatives. Uh, we have close relationships with a couple of the Islamic banks here uh, in Malaysia as well, um, and we are we are advising some of them on their digitalization strategies. So, you know, look, we are we are we are Pratama Digital is entering the market with a laser focus on solving these problems and putting the rug yet right in the middle, right? So whatever it takes, you know in order to solve the problems for them. Um, and if we can make a bit of money on the side, we're going to do it. You know, it doesn't have to be all us, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and another thing that we, another strength that I think we bring to the table is, look, um, if you want to have the customer's interests um, front and centre, uh, you have to be agnostic. You know, you can't be an e-commerce platform because perhaps this e-commerce platform is good for certain products. And another one, maybe a local one like, like Muda, perhaps is better for something else, right? Mm -hmm. And um, how are you going to promote to your customer that, no, you should go on Muda instead because Muda, customer, uh, Muda has better listings or, or, more, yeah. uh, or more customers going through? But you have to be agnostic, right? So we can tell our customers that, look, you need to earn this much income in order to meet the needs of your household. And based on the demographics, based on your, on your profile, on your household profile, on your capabilities and so on, we would recommend that you do, um, you know, nine to five on ride sharing and then perhaps five to seven doing food delivery 
on another platform, not the same one. And then perhaps your spouse um, could be selling on, uh, on on Instagram something, you know, uh, or it could be giving online lessons, say, you know, like Quran lessons and so on and teaching you how to monetize that. That's what we want to do, right? We want, unlike banks, what we're doing is we're not looking for the ideal customers, you know. We are yeah. trying to create them, you know. We have to create the customers. We can't just look for them. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so here comes the compulsory question. How confident are you in uh, being granted the license uh, to operate a digital bank in Malaysia? I, okay, so based on the framework that uh, the that Bank Nagara has had that published uh, late last year, um, we are focusing on, on a few key parts and we, we have, so in terms of compliance, we have, uh, I would say, probably one of the best um, like capital adequacy ratios in the market, uh, far above what incumbent banks are, are providing. Uh, we have a direct route, uh, route to uh, profitability. Um, you know, we have the the, the relationships um, that that are the, the collaborative relationships that are coming together to start to to solve this issue. So I'm really confident that we have met all the requirements of the framework, and exceeded them. In fact, and so based on that, we are very confident. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why I don't want to ask that question. Everybody's confident. 29 applicants are very confident that I'm not confident at all with you guys because not because of the capability or capacity that you guys can deliver. I'm sure that you can you guys can do the best. But it's just so tight, you know, 29 and 5, up to 5. It could be less than that. So it's it's a bit tough. So I really wish you all the best. Yeah, um, I'm sure there's a lot more conversation like this that can be brought forward. But uh but thanks, sure. thanks for sharing uh, and having a frank conversation with this uh, on my show. Thank you very much. That was Saifi Akhtar, Pertama Digital's Director of Strategy. They are applying for a digital banking license. And as per Saifi's uh, statement just now, and uh, some of the reports that we've been reading, uh, some announcements will be made very much later, uh, down three quarters from now, perhaps. Uh, but uh, we shall keep a good eye, a close eye on this moving forward. If you've missed any part of this interview, just head on to astroawani.com, look for Notepad, look for Patama Digital, look for uh, uh, Digital Bank. There's a lot of uh, resources for you to learn from there. You can also watch these kind of shows on your mobile devices. Just download the Astro Awani app wherever you get the application. Saifi, thanks again very much for joining the show. Thank you, Ibrahim. Such a pleasure.